Good morning, friends. Uh, my name is Alcris. I am the new kid in the block. Uh, <laughs> I started a few days ago when I moved from Ottawa to Winnipeg. And I am originally from Venezuela and I've been in the United Church since 1997. So I'm very excited um, about having this conversation, you know, a Friday light conversation with you. And it, it, the topic came to be by a question from Lori. Um, Lori, would you like to give a little bit of content to this? Oh, topic? right. <laughs> I forgot about that part. <laughs> so um, I, I attend a fairly diverse uh, United Church um, where there's people from all over the world. Um, and sometimes in our prayers or in our conversation from the uh, front of the church, uh, you know, someone might say, we uh, do this or we are like this. And, you know, it's not always true. <laughs> we are not all the same in our context. And so I, I really, I've really wrestled with how do you talk about uh, us as a community without assuming that we're all the same, or we all have the same background or the same um, starting places. And so uh, that's where this conversation started. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. And, um, and also, you know, how can we move from the other and us in the church as a result of that uh, experience? So, this is a very interesting question because we could look at it from different perspectives. And I'm going to spark the conversation exploring first the them and us part. Um, so who is them? It represents the other um, and other as a quality of being different. And it usually refers to members of a do non-dominant group. Us, on the contrary, speaks of sameness or the quality of being alike. And we build or bump into this invisible world, uh, wall that separates us. And we do that by othering. And othering is um, how we, it, it is a process when we look at a, uh, at others and say they're not like me or they're not like us. And this is usually unconscious. Um, and that's how we build uh, unconsciously or structurally our human connections and relationships. Uh, how can we move from other and us or them and us and how can we not assume that we are the same? So the result, let us focus on the ordering first. The result of the first experience you have is discrimination, exclusion, invisibility, marginalization, judgment, and it can happen overt and covert. And it's usually perceived when you are not in the center. You know, it's usually perceived by the outer members. And, um, but also it can happen like Lori, uh, Lori's question, like, you know, there is a good intention. We want to be welcoming and warm, but for some reason, uh, those in the uh, outside, I'm going to say, um, they still cannot move from them to us. And so trying to you know, understand the, those dynamics, I thought about the metaphor of the melting pot, like everybody blended as one. So everybody assimilate and melt and the result one taste. And this could, you know, um, answer part of the question, how can we be the same, you know, move to sameness. But, you know, if we think about a melting pot, 
um, does it really happen? So that's the pot, or I'm thinking about this too, maybe because I'm hungry. Uh, does it reveal reveals all the flavors that are in the stew? Maybe it has more meat than salt, and the salt gets um, overpowered. Um, so when we think about the melting pot, who is expected to assimilate and melt into whom? So what is the stake for the minority group? And I'm not only referring to, to race or ethnicity, but also, you know, for abilities, for gender identity, for sexual orientation, for age, like, you know, all aspects of uh, our social identity. So why feeling sameness doesn't come as quick as we wish for all uh, both groups. So if you have that answer, please write it in the chat. Why it doesn't come so quick? I would love to know to have that answer. <laughs> so, um, and the thing is, um, you know, differences continue to be there because we're different from one another. We are unique, we're diverse, and the creator said that it was good, right? If we think about any markers, uh, any of the markers, each one comes with a worldview, with experiences, with messages from the center or the dominant group. From that, which we don't see, that is the legacy of colonization that creates structures that are invisible and powerful in our everyday living, our personalities, our family of origin. So we are different and unique. So if the melting pot doesn't work, I thought about colorblind and we could say gender blind or age blind, like we don't want to see the difference. We, we, with that we firm, I don't see the difference. Um, and I ask again, is that possible that we don't see our differences? Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about the mosaic. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Sheila. Uh, so does it mean that we do not see the difference really? But I think what we are affirming with that is that it reinforces and the message of invisibility. When we say, for example, I'm colorblind, I don't see color, we're just denying the identity of the other person, you know? And that, you know, one of the impact on minorities is the feeling of being invisible and hurt. And um, so when we claim that colorblindness, it is good. It reflects, you know, good intentions. Like if me, it could be that you're saying, well, I don't want to, uh, you know, see your color because I was taught to be, to treat everyone the, the same. But as human beings, we all want to be seen, to be heard, you know, not to feel invisible, that part of my identity um, is not important or not seen. Like I was wondering, you know, how would be um, like, I, I was imagining a kid entering into a family room and, you know, and said, ta-da, this is me. And, uh, you know, and everybody clapping and celebrating the kid. And wouldn't be nice if we felt that way in the church? Like, ta-da, this is me with all my identities, with all that I bring, with all that I am. So it is not about deleting differences or avoiding talking to them. Sometimes we don't want to talk about difference because you know that we avoid to, to make, a, we want to avoid to say the wrong thing, to make a mistake, to, to make the person um, feel um, singled out, 
or you know it's better to ignore but i think um even though when you know different are uncomfortable uh, and usually they bother us because takes out takes us out from our comfort zone um and you know the fear of unknown and all of that uh, differences are a, a good place to start relationships uh, i'm going to tell you a story about me very short um once in my whole career um someone came to me and he was a uh, supposed to work with me and he said you know what i have never had a boss that is from a minority culture like it was a racialized person and whose and whose english is not their first language and and he said so you know that i don't feel okay <laughs> Imagine how I felt. That was, you know. Uh, but what we did, we started to intentionally having conversations and to sit and review our prejudices. You know, sometimes, well, mostly prejudices are unconscious and they but they are very effective in creating uh, biases in prejudging people without uh, knowing really them. So we started to meet once a week and we sat on a couch and we talked about cultural expectations, prejudices, how we felt, and uh, we developed one of the best working relationships that I have ever had. We became the best team ever and good friends. We are friends to this day. And we had the courage. We had the honesty. We had um, the intention to talk about our differences. At the end, we decided and the compromise was, you know, his strengths and my strengths and how we complemented each other and how we could identify, okay, this is part of my own prejudice. And, you know, and we built this wonderful, um, good experience. It wasn't easy. And that was one of the things that inspired me to take, um, you know, this um, peace and courageous conversations very seriously because I see the, the power of transformation in having those conversations. So difference matters and difference is not necessarily bad. Um, oh, okay. Now, if we think about difference, um, it, it's not only about listening, getting to know the other and having curiosity, and you know, be, take the risk to make mistakes because we are going to make mistakes. And um, I have <laughs> made many, even in reflecting about uh, oppression and uh, uh, inclusion and all of that. So, um, but if we don't invite, the element of power, because it's not only that we are uh, different, but also that there is power involved in those differences. Because we live and move in, in a society that is built upon colonialism and white supremacy, that are systems of hier hierarchy based on the, you know, very simply based on the claim superiority of one group over others. So society assigns this power and this privilege and this worth as it was noted in the chat. In the chat. And for example, if we think about white privilege, um, Peggy McIntosh, she is um, a feminist scholar. She 
articulated that this white privilege was like a, a backpack that is a sign, you know, um, not, you know, by marriage or it, it is just, you know, it comes with a, the color of your skin and it's mostly invisible for those who belong to that group. But for the others outside, uh, it's very, it's noticeable. And that's um, how I was telling um, Mingu in our group that I use my own experiences since I arrived in Canada uh, of being, you know, in places of privilege and places of marginalization. Uh, and one of them have been my, my language that I came from teaching and preaching in Venezuela. And I came here without <laughs> two words together. So um, I have used that to articulate um, this uh, topic and, um, and to offer the church the gift of my brown eyes. So instead of turning that as against them, it is a gift that we all, all of us can offer from our own uniqueness and our own um, social identities. So um, I was talking about power and, you know, how in the church do we communicate power? If we can think of our local churches or our, uh, you know, denominations, um, for example, how power is enacted in the church, in symbols, in the ways in which we interact, um, how it is enacted in written, in the bulletin, um, or verbally, and in even in nonverbal communication, whose voices are heard. And I know we have heard those questions, you know, for years and years and years, but power, we need to revisit because power is dynamic, is contextual. And sometimes we get so used to comfort to the way in which things are that we stop noticing that. But those in, in minority groups will notice. Now, power <laughs> in relationships, it comes to hospitality. And I have found that the United Church, that's one, well, and, I, and I, at one point I was the staff for the UCW as well. So there I learned about hospitality and fun and generous giving. Um, so, but, when we talk about hospitality and embracing or trying to welcome minorities in our church, and I, and I use the term uh, broad, different identities, um, whose space is that? Because when we think about hospitality, for example, I was invited, I am invited to have dinner with a neighbor today. And, uh, but that is, her space, her home. She told me what time I, she expects me. I know I will receive some hints about when it's a good time to leave. Uh, she's in control of the menu. Um, I know that, uh, you know, uh, there are unspoken rules in that household that I'm not aware of. So that's the role of the host. So in terms of the church, do we act like a host? You know, are we, whose space is this? If we think about the guest, you know, it's a passive role. Uh, we receive the invitation, we eat what is offered, and uh, we are attentive you know, to, to be polite and to follow what, what is happening around the table. So is this uh, the kind of dynamic that may be happening even in a very intercultural or moving towards an intercultural church? Like whose space is that? Are we hosts 
or the idea is that is in the intercultural church is to welcome one another, you know, to, to be in mutuality. Um, can you add anything else to the relationship between hospitality and, um, and the church? Um, because, you know, um, there is a good intention in hospitality. There is generosity uh, of heart. There is the intentionality of welcoming somebody. But it's like the term inclusion, you know, when we talk about inclusion, power is, um, sorry, power is enacted. Like because when we are including, we decide who we will be including and why we're still making the decisions and making the circle wide or not. And uh, I thought about the church in Corinth. You know, Paul described it as a very um, mixed, multi-dimensional church where because of the location of the city, you know, there were many uh, different um, class, you know, uh, of people according to their um, uh, society. And they had, you know, a variety of voices, women and all of that in, in the, what he offered uh, was the metaphor of the body, the church as the body of Christ. And a body that is interconnected, interdependent. And I'm going to read just um, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor in our, uh, in, our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. So that's in uh, 1 Corinthians 12. And he says um, after that, but the members may have the same care, like the, the, the understanding of the church as a body um, reflects like each member cares for the other. And after that, he offers this beautiful oath to love. So um, I was reading Richard Rohr uh, meditations. I think it was last week. He's the director of Center for Action and Contemplation. And he talked about, um, about a, okay. Uh, he talked about having a heart of hospitality. And that really caught my, um, my intention is having this heart of hospitality um, that he says that the spirit of justice is ho hospitality of heart because hospitality leads us to desire and work for the flourishing well-being and good of others. And when we practice hospitality inspired by Jesus, we restore justice. He says that um, when we open our hearts to hospitality, we feel compelled to seek justice. When we embrace creation, the poor, our enemies, strangers, foreigners, outcasts, and others, we desire justice for them. We welcome without judging. We love our neighbors as ourselves, and we reflect the justice, love, in hospitality of God. Thank you for joining us. Um, and um, I hope to see you again. <laughs> I have a prayer that I took from the book of um, Claudio Calvajes. He, he, he's from Brazil and he's a worship uh, professor. At, I think he's at Columbia University in the US. And he wrote these prayers with um, communities, uh, minority communities. And um, I'm going to read it. And if, yeah, I want it for us, for us each one to pick one. Uh, if we have time, let's do that. I will start. Let us 
build our Thanksgiving together for tears water of life that runs down our faces and connect our lives for the spirit of solidarity for when we are welcome for the hospitality of oppressed people for god's goodness running through the natural resources of this land for, for the, the ability to listen to wounded people for the chance to becoming better humans for the activists, community workers, and prophets who give their lives, gifts, and labor to the people of the world. For being together here. For clear water. For the spirit of resistance to injustice. For hope that comes from laughter and smiles. For faith and courage, for grace and reconciliation. We give you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.